Thank you for the armor cost. I plead guilty to the fact when I preach somewhere, I just preached at a church in Oregon a few weeks ago, and uh, we got out of the car, we went to walk in the building, and, and uh, I didn't go anywhere for a while. And the fellow I was with, he said, let's go. I said, I'm just enjoying your parking lot. <laughs> and it was a beautiful parking lot. I, I must have said that like four times. I walked all around the parking lot. I said, this is a beautiful. He was like, let's go. I was like, I just like the parking lot. I just, that's funny you said that, Brother Armacost. First Peter chapter 1 in your Bibles, please. First Peter chapter 1. My father was a pastor for 38 years before he retired. I was born two months after he accepted his first pastorate. And so I grew up in a pastor's home, uh, went to Christian school uh, after Christian school at, a, at an independent Baptist church. After that, I went to Bible college at an independent Baptist church. And now for 21 years, I've pastored independent Baptist churches. And I've heard in my lifetime, I can't tell you how many sermons about standards. I've heard dozens and dozens and dozens of sermons about standards. And I've heard not very many about holiness. And I believe in standards, and I'm going to actually show you, I think, the connection between those two today. But standards are an extension of the real subject, which is holiness. My third book I'm working on now is about holiness, and I'm not going to preach the whole book to you because we don't have time. Plus, it's not done yet. But um, this is going to be, I think, one of the chapters in the book before all is said and done. But look at verse 15, please. This is an excellent passage. Peter here is quoting the book of Leviticus. Verse number 15 of 1 Peter chapter 1, But as he which hath called you, that would be God, is holy. Holiness is the innate characteristic of what makes God who he is. The Bible said that he's pure, he's morally pure. Uh, the Bible says that God only does righteous things, he only doeth righteous things. Every single action and thought and decision that God ever makes is right. Do you know how you feel sometimes like your parents think you can't do a single thing right? Okay, well, God is the complete opposite of that. Every single thing he does and thinks and decides and works on is right. And God has lots of different characteristics, and there's lots of things about him, but I believe that holiness is his preeminent characteristic. Yes, he's just, and yes, he's merciful, and yes, he's a God of grace, and yes, he's a God of wisdom and all of these things, and I'm not trying to criticize or minimize those things, but I believe God's holiness is his primary preeminent attribute because it disciplines or rules over all the rest. So he's holy. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. You're related to him. You should, right? How many of you are saved? How many of you are awake? How many of you aren't sure what I just said, but you feel like you probably should raise your hand at this point? You're related to your Heavenly Father, and so you should, you should look like you're related to your Heavenly Father and sound like you're related to your Heavenly Father. You should think like Him and, 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 and operate like Him. And Jesus brings that out in the Sermon on the Mount when He says, as the children of your Heavenly Father. But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And I'll come back to that phrase in just a moment. Because, here's the reason why, because it is written, and here's where Peter quotes Leviticus, be ye holy... For I am holy. He said to his people, Israel in the Old Testament, I want you to be a holy people because I've called you out. You are my people. I'm your God, and you should look like me. It should, you should look like my people and sound like my people and act like my people and think like my people. You shouldn't be like all the heathens around you. You should be different because I'm different. I'm a holy God. You're my people. We should look like each other. Let's take a moment and pray here at the beginning, and then I want to talk to you for a few minutes on the subject, a visible holiness, not invisible, a visible holiness. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help me this morning as I preach to these precious young people. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to preach to people who are delighting in following you and eager to follow you, and I think for the most part, probably the vast majority of the young people in this room, that's the case. Lord, I didn't come this morning to yell at them or berate them. That's not my point. I came to help give them an understanding of why they are called to live the way they live the way they live, and I pray that you would give them that understanding and then help them to continue that way of living for the rest of their life. Amen. I'm going to give you a very simple definition of holiness. I like to give very big, long definitions, but I'm going to give you a very simple one. This is hard for me to do. I want you to know how painful this is, but I'm going to give you a very simple definition of holiness. Are you ready? Are you sure? How many of you are ready? How many of you don't know? How many of you are raising your hand because somebody besides you did? Good. Very good. You two fellows are my favorite. Really my favorite. 
Holiness is being like God. That's what holiness is. It's being like God. It is being like Jesus. Holiness is something to which every Christian is called. It's emphasized hundreds and hundreds of times in the Word of God. And with great clarity in our text in 1 Peter chapter 1, where God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now those handful of sentences I just gave you there after I prayed, almost every Christian I know uh, in anywhere in America would agree with those sentiments that we're supposed to be like Jesus and, 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 and God is pure and we should be holy people. They would agree with all of that. Well, why is it that their life so often looks so different? They'll often agree with those few sentences I just said, but there's substantial disagreement on what holiness is supposed to look like in practical terms. There's a large segment of American Christianity that agrees that holiness is good, but disagrees that a church or preacher should place any emphasis on visible holiness. Here's what they say. They say, well, holiness is a matter of the heart, so don't tell me what I can't wear, where I can't go, and what I can't say, and what I can't do. As long as my heart is right in the sight of God, that's all that matters. Essentially, what they believe is that, that God saved me and that God wants me to be holy, but holiness is a matter of what I am on the inside, and it doesn't affect the outside. And so you as a preacher should shut up about my outside because it has no bearing whatsoever. As long as my inside feels close to God, I'm good. They assert that preaching, which attempts to call men and women and boys and girls to a visible holiness, is legalism. And that in so saying, we're attempting to legislate external, visible holiness in a way that God never intended. They further contend that since it is impossible to see a person's heart, we have no business saying someone is or isn't holy based simply on what we can see. My contention is, as you might imagine, different. I believe Scripture teaches that holiness is an inward grace that works its way outward. In short, I believe holiness is not just internal but external. I believe in a visible holiness. Take your Bibles, go with me please to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm so excited because you have actual Bibles in your lap. So I can tell if you're at least acting like you're paying attention and not playing Sudoku or something on your phone. It's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> you say, what is that? I don't know, but one of my deacons plays it all the time. <laughs> Fortunately, he brings his physical Bible, but holiness, here's, here's my first statement. I got three statements this morning. Here's my first one. Holiness is first and most importantly, an inward grace. Now, I sound like I'm disagreeing with myself, right? What's the title of the message? Uh, visible holiness. And here I'm talking about the inside. Holiness is first and most importantly, an inward grace. First Thessalonians chapter three, look please at verse 13. This was our theme verse one year in our church. To the end, or the purpose here, Paul says, is that he may establish your hearts unblameable in what? Holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, he can come back at any moment. And Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, we ought to be found living holy. But what does he want to establish in holiness? He doesn't want to establish my hair in holiness. He doesn't want to establish my hands in holiness. He doesn't want to establish my feet in holiness. He wants to establish my heart in holiness. When you look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest sermon ever preached, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing sermon that I ignored as a pastor for entirely too long until God convicted me about it. Jesus spends the bulk of the time in Matthew chapter 5 getting back to this issue of the heart. You know how he goes over different commandments and he says, "Ye have heard that it hath been said, and then he says, but I say unto you, he, what he's doing is he's bringing back, he's not correcting Moses, he's not saying Moses was wrong in the Ten Commandments, he's giving us what Moses really intended when he conveyed God's commandments in the first place. For instance, thou shalt not kill. Well, thou shalt not kill is just, I shouldn't take this songbook and beat you over the head until you're not breathing anymore. Thou shalt not kill means I'm not supposed to be angry with you in my heart. Because where does... The fury and rage that leads, to, that leads to murder, where does that begin? Right here. Where am I supposed to deal with it then? Right here. Holiness is not just I don't do the physical action of hitting you. Holiness is that I deal with the feelings inside my heart that make me want to hit you. 
Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about adultery. You have heard that it hath been said, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if a man look on a woman to lust after her, he hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The action of adultery, the adultery started long before that in the thinking of my mind and in the feelings of my heart. And I'm supposed to deal with it as a Christian. I'm not holy as long as I keep myself from ever committing the actual act of adultery. That doesn't make me holy. I'm not holy unless I'm clean and pure in my... He wants to establish my heart unblameable in holiness. And you can sit here in this, I was going to say pews, you used to have pews in here, now you're a bunch of liberals, you got chairs. Um, you can sit here in these nicely padded chairs and your hair can be combed straight and your tie can be, can, can be done exactly the same and, and you can sing every note on key and you, can, and you can look on the outside like you've got it all together, but if your heart on the inside is going against God, it doesn't matter what the outside says, the inside is the problem. He's after our heart. You say you sound like you're arguing with yourself that you agree with the people you just said you disagree with. No, I agree that holiness is a matter of the heart. What I disagree with is the fact that it stays there. My second statement is this. This inward grace of holiness is to be visible outwardly. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let me show you the favorite verse of the people in the Bible that disagree with me. It shocks me that people would ever disagree with me. But they do. 1 Samuel chapter 16. There are several verses in the Bible that people love to point to. Judge not that ye be not judged. They don't understand that one. Um, they know these handful of verses that let them, they think, get away with what they, how they want to live their life. So they always come to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Give me a second, I need a drink of water. Um, and this is the story about uh, um, Samuel, right? He's going to choose who? Saul, you're going to choose David, right? And all of David's brothers, my, my faith in you, I, was, I, I was, had faith in you, but now it's devastated. Um, he's going to choose David, and he lines up all of Jesse's brothers, right? And they all look so good. And what does God tell Samuel? Look at verse number 7, 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance. Man, that guy is a good looking. He just looks like a king ought to look. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Hallelujah, says the short man in front of you. <laughs> because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as who? See, we as individuals, we weigh people or we make determinations based upon what we can see. But God doesn't determine things that way. Because God can look past just what people see, and he can look down and see their heart. What's he after? Their heart. So God's not impressed with how white my shirt is this morning or how carefully tied my tie is. That doesn't impress him because he looks past that and sees my heart. The Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now the people who disagree with me that think holiness is just a matter of the heart, that's all. They come to this verse and they say, look right there, it says that, that God looks at our heart and that's what he judges us on. And I say, amen, he does. But they totally missed the point that this verse says that man judges based on the outward appearance. Does God know if I'm a good Christian? I want my coworkers to know I'm a Christian. I want my neighbors to know I'm a Christian. I want the people I go to church with to know I'm a Christian. I want the people, when, when I go down, it's time to vote, and I walk in there, and I see people I see just only occasionally, the civic people and stuff, I want them to know I'm a Christian. When I go to the gym, I want them to know I'm a Christian. Wherever I go, people are going to make a judgment call, an estimation of what kind of a person I am, and they can't see my... So they do it based upon what they can see. I don't just mean my clothes, I mean how I conduct myself, my features, my face, my countenance, the words I use, what I say and what I don't say and where I go and where I don't go and everything about my life that they can see, they look at me and they make a determination, is this man genuinely someone who loves God or not? 
And because that's what they're looking at, when they look at my life, I want my life to be a testimony. I want my life to be a witness. I don't need to prove to God who I am. He sees my heart. I want the people who can't see my heart to see God reflected in my life. And this is where the Bible word conversation comes in. And go back with me, please, to the book of 1 Peter. The word conversation in the original language means conduct. I like to define it this way. Our conversation is everything about our life that speaks. My, you're listening to my voice right now, right? My voice is speaking. But there's more about my life that speaks than just my voice. Does how I treat my kids say something? Does how I pay my bills or don't pay my bills say something? Does what I wear say something? Lots of stuff about my life says stuff besides just my voice. I had a college president who used to say your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. You can say your one thing, but at some point people stop listening to what you say if your life doesn't match what you say. That's why it's so important when you look at the qualifications of a pastor in the book of 1 Timothy, they're all about the private part of his life that people can see the result of, like his marriage and his family and his children. My wife and I were talking about you dear folks here at Fairhaven recently, and uh, one of the things that we said to each other that we appreciate about this place is the children of, of the staff members that we've met. Two of them were impressed with, the rest not so much, but two of them were impressed with. <laughs> What does that tell me? That tells me that what you preach has been lived inside the home because nobody knows me better than my children. Nobody knows me better than my wife. And if they're living rebellious lives, it's uh, half the reason, three-fourths of the reason would be if I'm standing in a pulpit and preaching something different than what I live in my home. See, they see all the parts of my life that even my church people don't see. That says a lot about my life. The word conversation. The world has one way of conducting itself. It is lustful, it is selfish, it is proud, it is bitter, it is ambitious, etc. Such conduct or way of living is to be in the past for God's people. Paul makes this clear in the book of Ephesians. He emphasizes it for almost an entire chapter. He just preached 88 messages from the book of Ephesians, and he spends all kinds of time on it. He says, for instance, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. My conversation, the way I lived my life, the way I conducted myself, everything about my life that says something, in times past fulfilled the desires of my flesh. If I got mad, my desire was to swear, and so I gave into that. Well, that should be in my past. When I got, uh, uh, when I, in other words, whatever it is that I wanted, I just gave in to those desires, and, 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 and that is how I conducted myself, and that should be in my former life as a Christian. Ephesians chapter 4, that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. I'm corrupt when I'm unsaved. I'm walking according to the desires of my flesh, what I want. And that should be a way of living or conduct that is in the past for a Christian, not in the present. A visibly changed life is one of the most powerful arguments for the gospel. You take someone who's been a drunk and they get saved and then they don't drink anymore. I spent some time yesterday with a man in my church and he's been saved just a few years. And when he came to Christ, he had long hair. And when he came to Christ, he had a drinking problem. When he came to Christ, he had a, a, a mouth problem. He swore all the time. When he came to Christ, he was living in adultery. When he came to Christ, his life was a mess. And Jesus, as that song says, does beautiful things with our lives. And little by little, God has been working on that man. And you wouldn't recognize him today. I don't mean just the features of his face, but his life. He passes out tracts at work, and he, he, he witnesses to his family, and he, he buys all the clothes he can with Bible verses on them so he can witness to people even when he's just walking around. And he's got bumper stickers all over his car that talk about Jesus. And the people that knew him back then before he was saved that still know him now, to them he's an entirely different person. Well, that's the way it ought to be. 
Galatians chapter 1, Paul said, Ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. When you study Paul's life, Paul gets, he brings it up again and again and again. He, it's almost like he's constantly feeling like he has to apologize and say how sorry he was that before he was saved, he persecuted the church of God. Paul loved church. He gave his life to plant churches and to train men for ministry. He loved church. But before he was saved, he shut them down as often as he could. He'd go into churches and break them up. And, and, and the Bible says would take men and women and cast them into prison. He believed that that was what he was supposed to do as a zealous Pharisee. He needed to eliminate this sect of, of Christians. He needed to get rid of that so the Jews would be back on the straight and narrow of Judaism. And, and he was so ashamed of that that he'd given his life and his former life to persecute the church. And he wanted to show the fact that he was wrong. And he'd give his life now to support the church and, and promote the church and start the church and strengthen the church. He said, that was my former life. I was entirely different. The Bible says we're to conduct ourselves in such a way that our life matches the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. My conduct, how I live my life, everything about my life that says something should reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible ties this word conversation specifically to holiness. You're back in 1 Peter, right? Look at verse 15, please. But as he which hath called you is what? So be ye what? In all manner of what? How I conduct my life should reflect the holiness of God. My conversation, not just the words I speak, but everything about my life that says something. And just in case you don't get that point, what is the phrase that precedes the word conversation in verse 15? If you're still awake, look at your Bible. What's the phrase before the word conversation? All manner of. Now, wait a minute. I thought holiness was just about your heart. I thought holiness, I thought you were fine. As long as you and God had an understanding, as long as you feel close to God, it doesn't matter what you wear, it doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what you listen to, it doesn't, none of that matters. You can be as worldly as you want to be as long as your heart feels close to God. Because after all, he only looks at your heart. There's a phrase we have that I picked up when I was down south with that evangelist Brother Armacost mentioned a moment ago. It's a phrase that's used in Southern culture for people. You don't want to say they're idiots because that's not a nice thing to say. So you say, bless your heart. You know what I say to people who tell me that holiness is only a matter of the heart and not a matter of the outside? Bless your heart. See, you have swallowed a theological justification that lets you live the way you want to live and be as worldly as you want to live and still convince yourself you're a good Christian. But you listen to me this morning. I'm not a good Christian if it's just in my heart because God didn't save me just in my heart. Did he save me in my heart? Yes. Is that what's supposed to be holy? Yes. Is that what he looks at? Yes. Is that what's most important? Yes. Is that what we're supposed to say? No. Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling starts on the inside and works its way outward into my life. Why? Because people look at my life, and when they look at my life, they should not see Tom Brennan, and they should not see the desires of my flesh. What they should see is Jesus Christ. In every part of my life that says something, in all manner of conversation, all manner of conversation, all manner of conversation. Holiness should be visible. Peter gives two examples of this. Look at chapter 3, please, if you will. The first example of this is wives toward unsaved husbands. Now, this is a private example. This is what takes place in a home. I have some members of my church, that, some ladies that are members of my church that are married to unsaved husbands. And Peter gives us instruction about how they're supposed to win their husbands to Christ. They're supposed to stand up at the dining room table, get the biggest King James Bible you've ever seen, 
and force him to listen as they preach 60 minutes before every supper. <laughs> Men won't handle that. Men don't like that. You know what reaches an unsaved man? You know, how, you know how a saved woman reaches an unsaved man? With how she lives her life. This is not against confrontational evangelism. What he's saying is when you live in close proximity, when you're married to somebody and they're not saved and you are, the way you reach them is not with what you say. It's not nagging them until they finally agree to pray a prayer just to get you to shut up. No. You bring them to Christ because they look at your life and they're like, how can you have such an amazing life? And see, when you're married, you see all of it. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, speaking of a husband who's not saved, they, that is the unsaved husbands, also, may without the word or without the word of God be one, be one to the Lord, by the what? <laughs> That's it right there in the Bible. I'm supposed to nag him until he gets saved. Now, the word conversation doesn't just mean what you say. It's how you conduct yourself. It's everything about your life that speaks. Verse 2, well, they behold, that is the unsaved husband, behold your chaste. That word means pure. Conversation. Coupled with fear. How does an unsaved woman win her husband to Christ? By how she lives her life. Everything about her life that says something should say something about Jesus. He gives us another example of it in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Go back to chapter 2, please. And this is a public illustration. This is where you live your life not at home but around other people. Verse 11, dearly beloved, 1 Peter 2, verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. I'm at work. I, I, I work at church now, but I've done a lot of other work in my life and sold cars for a while, worked in a steel mill for a while, delivered pizzas, delivered meat, sold knives, sold insurance. My kids think I've done every job under the sun and they're almost right. But let's say I'm at the steel mill and I'm working, and, and we all know that steel mills are full of people who praise Jesus and love him, right? Oh, they're full of blue-collar union guys who, you know, they curse blue streaks, and they like sports, and they like their beer, and they like their girls. And, you know, it's, it, it's not an environment conducive to Bible study. <laughs> so I'm at the steel mill, and this crane operator won't bring my steel. I get paid by the hour, but I make a bonus based upon how much steel I cut. And when my, because it's a union shop, I can't go get the steel myself. I, that's his job description. He has to do that. I can only do my job description. So when it's time, when I, when I run out of steel to cut and I need more steel to cut, and I want him to bring me more steel, not just because I want to work, but because I want to make a bonus. And so the way I tell the crane operator I need more steel is I reach over beside my desk and I flip a light on. He's sitting down there reading the paper, which I'm not exaggerating. He's sitting down there reading the paper, and every once in a while he looks up from his paper and he sees that there's a machine that has a light on, and he gets up and he gets the crane and he gets a load of steel and he takes it there to the shear that needs the steel. Now, I want to make some money. That's why I went to work. So I've run out of steel. I'm still being paid by the hour, but I want to make my bonus. And so as soon as I, just before I run out of steel, I reach over and flip that light on because I want him to start prepping, bringing me the next load of steel I'm going to, I'm going to cut. He doesn't bring it. He just sits down there and reads his paper. Well, you know, I understand. Maybe he's engrossed in some wonderful article, a horoscope or something. I don't know. He's reading the paper. And to get his attention, I holler at him. Hey, Charlie, need some steel. You know what happens when you do that? Oh, he's never getting up from his paper now. How does that make me feel? You know what rises up in my heart? I start to get mad. So I take my gloves off, I put, put them up in a ball, and I throw them at him to get his attention. You say, how do you know all this? Because I've done it. <laughs> you know how he handles that? 
he walks over to my machine and he gets a long pole and he reaches up there and he breaks my light so it's not on anymore. That's what people do. You know what the tragedy of all that was? I wasn't acting like a Christian. I was acting like a lost man. I was responding to his laziness with anger, with selfish anger. No, my Bible says that when I'm among the Gentiles, I'm supposed to look at, did you look at verse 11? Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. I shouldn't give in to that desire in my heart to take that ball of gloves and whirl them at his head. Having your, verse 12, having your, are you with me? Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify who? Can they see your heart? Can they see your heart? Can they see your heart? Then it must be more than my heart that matters. They see everything about my life that speaks. What is the application of this? What kind of message does it send when my tongue gossips and squares? What kind of message does it send when my clothing and hairstyle and jewelry and makeup and tattoo choices are no different than the lost world around me? What kind of message does it send when I drink what they drink and wear what they wear and watch what they watch and talk about what they talk about? Here's the answer I get back. Stop being legalistic. God sees my heart. He knows I love him. And I say, stop being delusional. If you really loved him in your heart like you say you would, it would be evident to everybody around you. I have no interest in raising children who look right and sound right. They sit in the chair right. They open the hymn book right. They turn to the right passage in the Bible. They know how to say obscure Bible words and they know where obscure Bible books are and they know the, all the obscure Bible stories. They know how to tie their tie. They know how to go to church and look like they enjoy themselves and, and they know how to win a soul to Christ. They know how to dot the Baptist I's and cross the Baptist T's, but their heart is away from God. I have no interest in that kind of hypocrisy. But I also have no interest in having children that look like the world and talk like the world and entertain themselves with the world and love the world, all while deluding themselves into thinking they're holy. God's after my heart. But if he gets my heart, he'll get everything about my life that speaks. And if he doesn't, I'm fooling myself if I think he has my heart. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father.